Welcome back, this is Professor Bowen, and this is uh, ADM JC151. I got that wrong last week, I apologize. It's 151, which is the intro to corrections. So this week we uh, had a lot going on. There was a lot that went into your uh, discussion question. You guys did a great job with it. And we'll just reiterate right here. It says, describe some of the issues facing offenders returning to the community. How do these issues relate to recidivism? What impact does institutionalization, prisonization have on the offender upon release? And if you were in charge with the development of a transition assistance program for offenders re-entering the community, what would your program look like? And I realized that with this, we didn't state whether or not that program was going to be state or federally funded or if it was going to be private. So there was some that came up that some of the issues may be a little bit, uh, might find some, find some legal pushback or legal ramifications if they were strictly uh, state run. But if they're private, that's okay. That brings up another point. People were asking, well, are these mandatory or are these going to be the people who want to go through them? Uh, so again, if they were private then and, and they were uh, up to the offender if they wanted to go, then that would be fine. All right. Uh, so first off, we looked at everybody kind of focused on a few key things, food, housing, employment, which is great. Those are uh, some of the huge things that face people when they leave. Uh, people talked about, and I want to jump right down here where it says family systems. A lot of people talked about, well, we need support, we need family. Um, that may not always be a good thing. One of the conditions of parole is often to stay away from other offenders, other felons. And uh, so you don't really want to take somebody who is in a broken system and put them back into that broken system. Their chance of recidivism goes, you know, kind of through the roof. So it just depends. I mean, it could be a good thing to have your family around you, but if your family was part of the reason that you entered into this deviant behavior or part of the reason why you had these mental instabilities that push you towards a life of crime, it may not be a good idea to put you in that same system. So that may or may not be a good thing and something we'd have to look at individually. Um, one, of the, one of the posts brought up the idea of helping get birth certificates on IDs. I thought this was great. This is something we don't normally think about. We're so focused on getting employment, getting housing, uh, training. But what we don't realize is that all the training in the world doesn't do you any good if you don't have your I-9 information. Everybody here that's ever gone for a job, they ask for your driver's license, birth certificate. And if you don't have those documents, it can be very difficult uh, to try to get them. For anybody that's ever tried to write back to their hometown and try to get those documents, it's very frustrating. And so not necessarily doing it for them, but having assistance to teach them. So that's what we want to do. You know, education is the key with all of this. Show them, show the person re-entering the community, show them how to do it, how to go about getting a copy of their ID, a copy of their birth certificate, and maybe have some funds available to help pay for that. Because even though an ID is only $36 in the state of California, that can seem insurmountable to a person who just got out of prison doesn't know where their next meal is coming from. Um, we mentioned the uh, somebody put religious. We'd like to have a Bible-based uh, program, and, and that's great. The thing about religion or any kind of spirituality is it can give people an idea of being part of something so that they're not alone out there, and that's great. The only uh, issue with that is it does violate... Uh, the law, you know, the separation of church and state. So if it was going to be a private institution, a private transition program that people could opt to go to, then that would be fine. If it was going to be public, if it was going to be run by the parole board, then it would need to have encompass all religions uh, so that people could pick and choose which ones they wanted to. But certainly not a bad idea in any way, shape, or form. We also talked about the stigma. People coming out have a really hard time finding work because once they check that box that says, yes, I've been convicted, we feel like they get blacklisted. Well, we know that in this country, and so a lot of states have given certain industries like HVAC, which is heating and air conditioning, uh, oil fields, um, uh, you know, other welding, jobs like that. They give them tax breaks if they hire uh, previously convicted felons. Uh, that just kind of gives them opportunities. So some of you put that in your transition assistance programs that you would work very closely with those agencies to make sure that you were connecting the offender, uh, the ex-offender, with those agencies to make sure that they could, uh, uh, that they could find employment. Um, some of these, it looked like you wanted to start your transition assistance program after they were released. I think that's a little too late. The idea of what we're looking at is should we be doing this prior to, you know, a lot prior to, like 18 months maybe, you know, six, anywhere from 6 to 18 months before they leave, should we be getting them drug rehabilitation? Should we be getting them uh, transition, these transition assistance skills? 
uh, like um, vocational training, get them certified as a welder, all these things, so when they leave, they're ready the day that they leave. Of course, that doesn't mean that we're not going to have the parole afterwards. They still need to meet with their parole officer, meet all those guidelines, demonstrate that they're they're staying gainfully employed, demonstrate that they're uh, keeping up a house or paying their rent, all those things. Um, so that's good. One of the things that I didn't see that I wanted to bring up, a, a few people touched on it that's really important, not so much the stigma, but the idea of this institutionalization or prisonization. What that means is you become so dependent on the system, you become so used to the system that you don't know how to do a lot of things. Some of these life skills, those are perishable. Those go away. Um, you know, I'm, I'm an old man, obviously, and I've been driving for a very, very long time. But on my last tour to Iraq, when I went, I had a driver. I was the tactical commander, the squad leader, so I never had to drive. I had a driver. Everywhere we went, if I wanted to go to PX, wherever, I had a driver. And so for 18 months, I didn't get behind the wheel of a vehicle at all, uh, which doesn't seem like a long time. But when I got back, uh, it felt like I had never driven before. I, I was... Uh, you know, it was difficult to reacclimate to the rules of the road and all the mechanics. It, it, it just seemed to fade away very quickly. Well, it's the same thing with this institutionalization. Not only have they forgotten these skills, but time has marched on and uh, technology has moved so far forward. They may not have ever seen a smartphone. They may not have to know how to pay their bills online. They might not know how to pay their bills at all. If you think about when you very first moved out, and you realize, oh my gosh, I have to get the water turned on. Where do I even go to do that? That's a very, very scary thing or frightening thing for these people who are coming out of a system that has done everything for them. They didn't have to worry about rent. They didn't have to worry about water bill. They didn't have to worry about the electric bill. They didn't even have to plan their meals. Now you're asking somebody to grow to the grocery store with a certain amount of disposable income and try to think out uh, what do I need? What, what goes into a meal? How do I cook a meal? What do I put in there? And those life skills they may not have. Balancing a checkbook, they may not know how to do that. So I think all of those would also be very beneficial in this transition assistance program. Again, if you think back to the very first time you went to the grocery store on your own, I, I moved out when I was 17, and my very first trip to the grocery store was laughable. I had nothing but ding-dongs and Doritos, and it was all going to be a great good time because I was out on my own and nobody was going to tell me what to do. But then when it came time to make an actual meal, I was like, oh, either I make a, you know Oreo cookie omelet or I starve to death. So it can be a very, very frightening thing for people reentering the system. So we want to keep that in mind in our transition assistance programs is that we have to, aside from all of this, we also have to realize that those life skills are gone. And that kind of goes right into this housing and food. I saw a lot of people say, hey, we need to provide them food, we need to provide them housing, and that's great, but there has to be a definite end date on that. There has to be a definite end date on the food and housing, and there has to be a process to wean them off of the food and housing. Because we have to remember part of this institutionalization is that they've had every meal taken care of for them. They've had their room and board taken care of for them. So they have become dependent on the system, and we want to remove them from that dependency and increase their own self-efficacy, because otherwise we create despair. If they don't know where their next meal is going to come from, then we create despair, and that despair can turn into deviant behavior. Well, if I can't get food, I'm just going to steal it. So to avoid that, we don't want them to go hungry, but we don't also don't want to just continue to give them food. So there has to be a midway. I like the idea that you guys put of food vouchers, food stamps, those are all good ideas, but there has to be a weaning off process, and there definitely has to be an end date when they know, hey, this is the last time you are ever going to get this, you need to uh, you know, move forward. And hopefully during that process, checks and balances, so that they're not just getting cut off. Okay, here's your last meal ticket and you're done, because that would be no different than release date, right? Then they would have that same kind of despair, and I don't know where my next meal is coming from. So the idea behind this is during that process, the parole officer or the transition assistance program manager should be very involved, like, okay, we're getting closer to where you're going to be, you know, off of the food stamps or out of the housing, what have you done? Show me how many places you've gone and applied. Show me your grocery list. Something that simple, write out a grocery list and show me. Things that we take for granted are things that, skills that have been lost, that can be, you know, uh, retaught certainly, but they're skills that have been lost and we want to make sure that they have. So you guys did an excellent job on this. There were some great ones. For the first time ever, I think I actually saw some people getting at each other instead of the, the issue. Remember, I encourage you to debate, but we always want to debate the subject, not the person. Let's not attack the person. Let's look more at the subject. We don't want to attack somebody's experience or lack thereof. We're all here to learn. We all can learn more, and we can't take one 
incident that we know of that's personal to us and say, well, this is how the rest of the world works because of this isolated incident. So we can experience this great, but we need to look beyond that. We need to look again at this word you're going to, or this phrase you're going to hear over and over in criminal justice is the totality of circumstances, right? You want to look at the totality of the circumstance, not one isolated incident. So bearing that in mind, you guys did good. You have another quiz coming up in week four. Um, so keep your eyes out for that. Your, well, your midterm, I'm sorry, it's not a quiz. Your midterm is going to be in week four. Uh, it'll be the same as the quiz, the same style. Remember, there's sometimes in the fill in the blank that the computer won't know the answer. That's okay. Uh, I check them when it closes, but I still encourage you, if you want to, to shoot me an email and say, hey, I think I got this right. Can you look at it for me? Definitely after it closes, if you see that your grade hasn't changed and you think it could, then certainly shoot me an email. Um, want to make sure I still saw a few people not completing the entire um, discussion question. Remember, it's your discussion post, then two other people, not in your own thread. You have to go to two other people's threads and comment on those. Um, and it should be something substantial, which they all have been. I've seen very, very few that weren't substantial. You guys are doing an excellent job. So just keep up the good work. And uh, other than that, I'm going to check in on you next week.